I think that whenever politics starts to center on those concepts of identity and insiders and outsiders, as was the case back in the 1860s with the Civil War, and I would say again in the 1960s with campus unrest and Vietnam and civil rights and, you know, who's an American, who isn't. And now I think we're at it again. I'd say whenever that happens, then I think politics is going to be particularly intense and frequently bloody. And now The Good Fight with Yasha Monk. There is some reason to hope that democracies will finally stand up for their values. After years in which the European Union has ignored the threat from authoritarian populists like Viktor Orban in Hungary and Kaczynski in Poland, after the terrible presidency of Donald Trump in the United States, we are now seeing a little bit of movement towards asserting democratic values. Joe Biden has promised to put the protection of democratic institutions at home and abroad at the center of his agenda. The European Union is starting rule of law initiatives against Poland and Hungary. And yet, I fear that many of these actions will turn out to be a case of too little, too late. We are already, for example, seeing a backtracking by the EU, which ensures that Poland and Hungary will continue to receive EU funds for at least the next years. And when the United States convenes its democracy summit that the Biden administration has announced in the next years, it may end up not having a clear agenda. It may end up feeling like it has to invite authoritarian leaders of formerly democratic countries like Hungary or the Philippines. So in a new piece in foreign affairs, I try to lay out what it would look like for countries to pursue democratic values in a more concerted fashion. One important measure, I think, would be to make very clear that democracies will distinguish between fully democratic allies with whom they will actually be willing to cooperate very closely, and important countries with which it is willing to have a lower form of strategic partnership, even though they are democratically backsliding, because they will be helpful in containing the rise of other autocratic countries. The United States will have to continue to engage with countries like India in its attempt to contain the influence of China. It has to work with Poland to contain the pernicious influence of Russia in Central Europe. But it should also make clear that unless those countries return to democratic norms and rules, it will not be a close friend of them. The second is that we should think about protecting democracy rather than promoting it. We should recognize that democracy at this point is on the defense and that we should devote many more resources to ensuring that countries that already have democratic institutions are able to sustain them than to hope to expand democracy in areas of the world that are not yet democratic. By and large, the agenda of democracy promotion has not been as effective as democratic protection could be. And the third and perhaps most provocative major point is that this means we need to rethink the basic structure of some of our institutions. At the moment, the European Union claims to be a club of values, but tolerates in its midst countries that are no longer true democracies. NATO claims to be based on values and to have an effective military alliance, but now includes countries like Turkey, but neither stand up for those values, nor very clearly want to be part of this side of the military alliance. Both the EU and NATO need to stipulate much clearer rules of membership and introduce better mechanisms for expelling countries that are no longer able to sustain its mission, even if a refounding is required for them to actually be fit for purpose. That is better than a slow and perpetual drift in mission, which makes them unfit for purpose. So I am very heartened by the EU's stated commitment to protecting democracy in Poland and Hungary. I am incredibly happy that we now have a president in the United States who cares about democracy around the world, but we need to embrace a more ambitious agenda 
if we are actually going to ensure that resurgent autocracies don't win the day and we're able to protect our democratic systems. This week, I had a very interesting conversation with John Hibbing. John is a political scientist. He teaches at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And he wrote a really interesting book called The Securitarian Personality, What Really Motivates Trump's Base and Why It Matters for the Post-Trump Era. The basic idea of it is that some of the political science research around ideas like the authoritarian personality is a little bit misguided, that what really drives Trump supporters is not authoritarianism and not straightforwardly racism, but a protection of the in-group, a heightened sense of threats from the out-group, which is a little bit more anarchic and a little bit more chaotic in energy, he thinks, than something like the idea of an authoritarian personality might imply. So we had a pretty fun discussion about how to think about the support for populist movements around the world and what implications that it has for the prospect of us strengthening our democratic institutions over the next decades. John Hibbing, welcome to the podcast. I'm very happy to be with you. So your work caught my eye because you have been uh, really trying to think through what it is that drives and motivates supporters of uh, Donald Trump specifically, and I suppose similar for a town populist more broadly. I've had Karen Stenner on in a past episode of a podcast. She really thinks that you can understand a lot of what drives that side of the political spectrum by what she calls the authoritarian personality. As I understand it, you think that that whole research program is not exactly right, but we should think about it in different ways. So help us understand what drives the supporters of Donald Trump, and then we can go a little bit into what the implications of that might be later in the conversation. Right. Well, yes, it's true. I mean, your setup was accurate, except perhaps, I guess I wouldn't, I don't think I'm disagreeing with the research agenda on authoritarianism and the authoritarian personality. I maybe am reacting a little bit to that label. I just don't think authoritarian with authority at the center of that term is an accurate way of thinking about them. And part of it started because, you know, I'm in Nebraska, not in Berkeley or Boston. So I'm around a lot of Trump supporters. I have them in my classes. I have them in my extended family. And the more I looked at them and observed them and just thought about them, authority and a desire to submit to authority, which is at the core of authoritarianism, just didn't describe them, didn't capture what they were about. Remind me of exactly what the sort of questionnaire that is used to gauge authoritarian personality asks about. I understand that it's actually a set of questions about education, right? Because you don't want to ask do you like this authoritarian political figure? Because that would be sort of the independent variable which close to the dependent variable, which is to say the thing you're measuring would be too close to the outcome you're trying to see what it predicts. So people use this slightly strange battery of questions about things like, do you think it's more important that your child is creative or that it listens to its parents and stuff like that, right? Tell us about how people actually traditionally measure that. Exactly. And that is part of my concern, I guess. And You know, this research stream goes way back to 1950 with a famous book called The Authoritarian Personality growing out of World War II, trying to understand fascism. And you're right. A lot of the questions that tap so-called authoritarianism these days, to me, don't have much to do with authority. They're kind of a hodgepodge of items on abortion and religious rights. And you can see maybe a connection, but it's a certain type of authority. And that's why you know, a lot of people have pointed out before me that you can get a set of items that really correlate strongly with political views, with being a liberal or being a conservative. But if you're asking questions about gay marriage and abortion, you know, you're going to get strong correlations and it doesn't really provide a lot of explanation. So I guess my goal was not to say that all those items are wrong. They're fine if you just want to describe. But if you want to understand and get kind of at the core of this, what's really motivating these individuals, then I think you need a more focused set of questions. And that's what I try to do. All right. So if we're sort of skeptical that either this sort of idea, this word of overtime personality actually picks up exactly what's going on, or perhaps that question battery is the right one that you can get from what are your preferences in educating a child about what the most important sort of virtues of it are to, all right, we'll have a meaningful insight about your sort of political attributes. You prefer the term, I understand, this, this securitarian personality. How is that different? It sounds somewhat similar, right? I mean, what's the important difference between securitarian and authoritarian? And, and how do you measure that? Right. Well, the big difference is that it is a more focused set of items, and it deals with just what it says, security, whereas those authoritarian items deal with all kinds of things that, to me, don't have much to do with authority at all. 
you know, we can call them authoritarians if we really want, but I just hope we recognize that a lot of the items that we use to measure that have nothing to do with authority. I like to think that all my items have to do with security. So let me talk about that. I think that's the next step because it's not any type of security. These are people who really want to be protected from invasions into what they view as their in-group, their insiders. They want to be secure in their person, in their family, and in their culture. And they're very sensitive to outside individuals, outside human beings. I'm emphasizing this because obviously these are individuals who seem to be quite cavalier in their desire to be secure from an RNA virus, let's say, or from climate change. Try to think of it from their perspective. And for them, a bad guy with a gun, somebody we can't control, who's not like us, who maybe comes from a different country or doesn't seem to be all that eager to abide these rules and norms, that's who we have to worry about. So the items I design, they correlate fairly well with some of those other items, but to me, they have a little bit more a theoretical coherence. And I think that's pretty important if we're trying to really understand them. At Qualcomm, we believe in staying connected and you can see us wherever 5G is helping transform telemedicine, supporting remote education and powering mobile PCs. The Invention Age is here. Learn more at qualcomm.com slash invention age. And so tell us a little bit about the kinds of questions that you do ask and why we should think that they are, in fact, meaningfully related to voting for Trump, for example, what the evidence for that is. Well, I was able to do a couple of surveys, one in the middle of 2019 and one in 2020, just a few months before the election. I didn't want them to be about the election. My goal was not to talk about who voted for Donald Trump and who didn't. I really wanted to get at who was very enthusiastic about Donald Trump, who was an intense Trump supporter rather than just who was a, a Trump voter. I mean, almost all Republicans voted for Donald Trump, and that wasn't my interest. My interest was who these intense supporters are. So the kinds of questions I asked would be things like, one of the worst things that a human can do is to not be strong. And then I had a similar item for the country. One of the worst things for a country to be is, is not to be perceived as strong. And those are the kinds of items where the supporters of Donald Trump, the people I call securitarians, just kind of come out of their socks and like. So that this to me is at the core of it, the desire for a personal strength. And, you know, it's, it's not always using that strength. They're more into building walls rather than invading other countries. So it's strength in a very defensive kind of posture. And that's not to say some of them aren't aggressive. That's another part of authoritarianism that comes into play. But to me, the core of it is to have this protection, this vigilance. Um, and so those are the items I try to design. And so one problem that I know people face when we talk about the authoritarian personality is that it's hard for a constant to explain change. If there's about a third of the population that someone like Karen Steiner argues has this authoritarian personality, why is it that the happy version of someone like Mitt Romney in one moment and somebody like Donald Trump in another moment? And her theory, I suppose, is that those personality traits get triggered or activated when people feel a threat to traditional forms of authority or a sort of general form of risk, and when suddenly people who might be difficult to distinguish from each other in more normal times react very differently to those kinds of threats. How does your theory deal with this problem of how it is that if a certain portion of a population that has the secretarian personality, why does that seem to really come to the fore politically in certain moments more than in others? Yeah, that is a really good question. My view is that these individuals are always here. That gets to your point of, well, then how do we explain this? And in other words, I hope this isn't going too far back, but I think there's an evolutionary basis for this. If you think about it, when we were hunter-gatherers, you know, the size of government or transgender bathrooms or capital gains taxes, those weren't issues, obviously. But I do think this notion of how we treat outsiders, you know, that tribe over the hill, how are we going to orient ourselves to them? There was quite a bit of in and out migration, by the way. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or what do we do? What about if somebody violates a norm? How do we treat them? You know, I think those are the kinds of issues that to me have evolutionary centrality. And I think that whenever politics starts to center on those concepts of identity and, and insiders and outsiders, as was the case back in the 1860s with the Civil War, and I would say again in the 1960s with campus unrest and Vietnam and civil rights and, you know, who's an American, who isn't. And now I think we're at it again. I'd say whenever that happens, then I think politics is going to be particularly intense and frequently bloody. So I'm not giving you a direct answer as to why exactly it happened when it did. I can't. I'm not that smart. But I do think we go through these cycles. And that's not to say that issues like transgender bathrooms and capital gains taxes aren't important. But I do think that the divisions that we have in society are particularly intense when they have to do with these insider-outsider kinds of issues.
So that's interesting, right? I mean, so there's a similar mechanism of activation where if politics is framed around should your tax rate be 2% higher or 2% lower, there's going to be divisions in society and there's going to be people who care a lot about politics who fight for this, but it's not going to activate the securitarian threat in exactly the same way. When politics becomes about other people streaming across the border that's not sufficiently secured, according to some people, or, you know, who truly gets to be an American, who is at the top of our pyramid of social prestige and who's at the bottom of it, those seem to trigger the securitarian personality more and then activate people. That was very well said, by the way. Well, thank you very much. I don't expect you to explain why this happened in 2016 or 2020 as opposed to 2006 or 2010, but tell us how that was activated. I mean, how is it that in our politics at the moment, it sort of activates that circular personality and what the implications of that are for how we might overcome that. Is it to double down on these cultural divisions and make sure that the good guys win? Or is it to try and reframe politics so that it's no longer about these insider-outsider issues? And what might that look like? How is that possible? If I could start with a latter point, that's a good one. You know, I think it reminds me a little bit of Madison's ideas, right, about cross-cutting cleavages and that What I think would really help our politics today is if we did get in a good old fashioned argument between Democrats and Republicans, it really had very little to do with these kind of evolutionary divisions that we're talking about. It sounds odd to wish for more divisions, but I do think that we're stuck in this set of issues that are so salient right now that do kind of cut to the bone that that's made things really challenging. And I hate to say it, but I'm not very optimistic about moving forward. I mean, I think as I said, I believe these divisions have always been there. And sometimes they're kind of hidden. We're not aware of them. We're talking about other things. And we can go through long periods of time without that being the focus of politics. But now that it is, I just think it's hard for us to get away from that. I think it can probably happen, but it's hard to see. A lot of times issues that don't seem to be related to these insider-outsider issues are, like uh, some economic issues, welfare spending, for example. I gave a, a talk once in Denmark, and I remember somebody pulled me aside and said, Danes are very polite. So this was after the public presentation. And they said, well, you know, that doesn't really fit in in our country because all of our right-wing parties are still supportive of the large social welfare net that we have in this country. And I said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's true. But what about for new immigrants? And they said, well, no, of course, there, that's where the parties really diverge. So I guess I mentioned that because I think that to me says it looks like an economic issue, but it can very easily become this issue of insider, outsider, who deserves what and who are we with? So that's fascinating to me because I think one way of describing the last five or 10 years is that certainly with the rise of Donald Trump in the United States, but also with the rise of far-right populist parties in many other countries in the world with developed democracies, you had the cultural right really pushing the insider-outsider distinction, saying, look, there's all these outsiders coming in, they're destroying your country, they're a danger, we got to go and defend against them. And so it activated the insider-outsider dynamic in a much more extreme form than had been the case previously. And then I think, especially in the United States over the last four or five years, the reaction of a lot of the left has somewhat understandably been to say, well, look, we've got to defend the people who you're casting as outsiders against these unfair attacks and a lot of unjust policies that these politicians are pushing. And we're actually going to emphasize in every aspect of society, we're going to look for the insider, we're going to look for the outsider, and we're going to talk about how unfair the treatment of the outsider is. And so we're going to try and maximally recast as many debates as possible, from how to distribute vaccines to, you know, the coronavirus pandemic, to questions of culture that may seem quite remote. I saw a thing that Vox published recently. It's a very silly example, but I think it's telling in how silly it is. Some mommy blogger who advises people on how to get their kids to sleep apparently donated a thousand dollars to Donald Trump. And so Vox wrote a piece about, you know, can you still in good conscience, you know, take this blogger's advice on how to get your baby to sleep, right? So, so everything is being recast now by the left as well in this insider-outsider dynamic. And I guess if the question is, how do you get the Republican Party to get away from somebody like Donald Trump now that he's out of office? Or how do you get people in the middle who may vote for the Democrats or they might be tempted by the Republicans to prioritize some of their other interests, some of the other identities over the insider-outsider dynamic? Then I guess perhaps the instinct of the left or of Democrats should be to tamp down the extent in which we frame everything around insider-outsider cleavages. Would that be your sort of campaign advice or your advice for either the Democrats to win elections or Americans have retained some form of sanity? Or do you think that's just not possible? That if one side is pushing the insider-outsider dynamic, there's no way of getting around it. You just got to play within it. 
I would make just a slight emendation to your premise, and that is I don't think the left's position is actually a reaction to some new attitude on the right that is anti-immigrant, pro-nativist, and all those things. I actually think that that division has always been with us, and it's not just a division of the right having these attitudes. I think the left desire to open our arms to outsiders and actually to even reject this notion of insider-outsider. A lot of people on the left, that's not the way they think about the world, so those terms aren't valid because they want to reach out to everybody. And to me, that's the core division, and I think it's always been there, and I think it was there on the left, with or without the right kind of going off in these last several years and really getting some traction with these right-wing parties. So that's a slightly different framing. To me, if I had to figure out somebody's position on politics, and I just had one question, it'd really be, how should we orient ourselves to outsiders? Should we welcome them or should we keep them at arm's length? And I just think that is as basic as it gets. And a lot of the rest of politics kind of gloms onto that. That's interesting. It's a little bit similar to the conversation that I've had recently on the podcast with Jonathan Hyde, where I think I slightly disagreed with him about the extent to which the left cares about issues like sanctity. His stance is that the left cares less about sanctity. I wonder whether we define sanctity slightly differently on the left than on the right. And I think in a somewhat similar way, I'm wondering in this conversation whether it isn't more that sort of the way we frame insider-outsider is different on the left than the right. I think a lot about the wonderful Tom Lehrer quote, a satirical singer and pianist from the 50s and 60s, who says, you know, it's very important that we should be more tolerant and that we should love our fellow human beings. And, you know, sadly, there's some people in the world who do not love their fellow human beings, and I hate people like that, right? And there's something, I think, about, you know, a lot of my friends and colleagues in academia and in media they really hate 50% of America. You know, look, I hate Donald Trump. And I think that he was a dangerous and terrible president who represented and to some extent still represents a real danger for American democracy. But I also think that part of what it is to live in a democracy is that you can't just write off the close to 50% of people who voted for him. And you have to look for good in them and you have to think about how it is that you get them back to a democratic fold. But if you say that on Twitter, you get beaten up every time, right? I mean, there are people who... I think, want to not to see the worst in a lot of their fellow citizens, but they actually at some level get emotional satisfaction when the Republican Party yet again proves to be shamefully incapable of standing up to Donald Trump, because it actually confirms the priors that this country is maximally unjust or a part of this country is maximally bad. And so I think you know, isn't that a different way of forming insiders outsiders? So that rather than some people having the secret term personality and others not, it's that for people who are more on the populist right, the key insider outsider distinction is Christian versus atheist or Jewish or Muslim or American versus Mexican or, you know, whatever else it might be. But for the left, it's sort of people who have the right tolerant beliefs on these things and the people who are not with a program that, that may be a better way of drawing the insider-outsider distinction. I'm not saying that they're exactly morally equivalent, but it's just that for them, the axis of what makes somebody an insider or an outsider is different. And then they're just as willing to say, you know, if you're an outsider and you say the wrong things on social media, we got to shut you up because you're a real danger. And so, you know, anybody who doesn't want to shut you up is actually a kind of traitor and needs to be pushed back on and punished in ways that aren't entirely dissimilar to what the most diverted supporters of Trump might say about if you're willing to let these illegal immigrants come in, then there's really something wrong with you or something like that. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. I talk a little bit about this in the book that increasingly the division seems to be not between insiders and outsiders, but between people who have one attitude toward outsiders and have another attitude toward outsiders. So it's almost like outsiders are becoming a prop in this great ideological battle. So I think you're absolutely right about that. At one point, I play around with this with kind of a thought experiment. If you had a bunch of what I call securitarians, and they could live in one of two societies, one in which it's very diverse, ethnically, racially, you name it, but everybody has their same securitarian beliefs. You know, they really want to strengthen core America, insider America. Or they could live with a bunch of fourth generation white Christian males who had a variety of beliefs. I'm pretty sure they take the diverse society that was ideologically homogeneous. And it's probably the same on the left in reverse. Well, a lot of left wing spaces, in fact, are very homogeneous, but with a great emphasis on diversity. Yes, that's exactly true. So, and yeah, to your earlier point, believe me, I understand the trouble you can get into when you try to kind of 
describe, in this case, Trump supporters without using a lot of judgmental phrases. That's what I do. And I don't mean that people shouldn't, and I don't mean that I'm trying to give them a free pass, but I think in the spirit that you described, there's some value in understanding them. You don't have to like them. And, you know, if I believe that calling them racist or stupid would make them less racist than stupid, I think I would be doing it in a minute. But I just, I don't think that's going to get us anywhere. And I think we'd be better off if we tried to understand them, not to say they're equivalent to us, anything like that, but just get down underneath the skin and figure out what drives them to be so different than we are. Yeah. So how do you reform this space? If you have a bunch of people who have a securitarian leaning, that's a constant. We're at the moment at a time when that's particularly activated. Certainly sort of denouncing them in maximal terms probably does not help. What's the off-ramp? You said that you're pessimistic about the development of the next years. So perhaps you can give us two scenarios. One, which is the pessimistic one, how the insider-outside dynamic can perpetuate and radicalize itself and where that might leave us. But perhaps, however realistic you think it is, you can also give us the optimistic scenario, which is what would it look like if 10 years from now, I have you back on the podcast and we say, hey, you know what? Really, after the beginning of 2021, things got better what story would we be telling in retrospect about these 10 years that would have led us to that optimistic conclusion? Well, my pessimistic scenario is different than the people who describe this group of individuals as authoritarians. And I guess that's why, you know, it might seem like I'm just being picky in a terminological sort of way. But what worries me is that we become more concerned, that those of us who really care about democracy in America and elsewhere will become so concerned with this kind of takeover of the media or the courts and everybody's forced to think a certain way. I mean, that's authoritarianism. When to me, the real danger and my real source of pessimism is that we're going to have this, I'm going to say roughly 20% of the population that has just ardent securitarian beliefs, that they're going to kind of increasingly isolate themselves from the political system and even disrupt it on occasion, which is a very different concern than authoritarian concern that somebody like Donald Trump is going to take over America and make it impossible for diverse views to be there. We shouldn't be cavalier about that. But I think we should recognize that, to me, the real danger going forward is that when they don't have leaders like Donald Trump in office anymore, that they're going to pull back and just take shots at things, not trust anything. You know, to me, the extreme version of a Trump supporter is not an authoritarian or a fascist. It's a survivalist. I think their instinct is to reject authority. They hate it. And we certainly saw this through the COVID situation. I mean, ask Gretchen Whitmer if those people up in Michigan like authority. They can't stand it. You know, narrow situations in which they'll accept it when they're exactly on their wavelength in terms of attitudes toward outsiders. But that, to me, is my pessimistic scenario, is that America almost becomes ungovernable, that leaders are too weak, not too strong. Do you want me to try the optimistic side? Yes, please. Give us a little bit of hope. There's a lot of interesting (laughs) things in there, but give us a little bit of hope first. Well, to me, this is weak gruel, I'm afraid. But I think one step in the right direction would be to understand that these people are like that. I think we kind of drive ourselves nuts when we think that we can change them. You know, if we could just get them to stop listening to Fox News or to... O-A-N-N or, you know, whatever the thing is today, or if we could just turn off their, you know, right-wing crazy accounts on social media, that we're going to be okay. And I'm not saying any of those are bad ideas, but I just, at the core, you're not eliminating this very serious personality tendency to crave strength and, and vigilance and homogeneity. And so I think my first step would be to recognize that those people are like that, and there's not something we can do to change them. Just like there's probably not much they can do to change us. However, I do think we can learn to talk to each other a little bit better. I'll give you one example here. So something like the environment. You know, if you just talk to a Trump supporter and say, look, we've got a moral obligation to save the planet, that's not going to do anything at all. But if you can put it in terms like, well, you know, if we can do this in the United States, if we can get a leg up on some other countries, this is actually going to be better from a defense point of view and it'll protect the business community better. You know, I think I'm not expressing this very well, but there are ways of framing those issues. But to do that, you first have to understand what they're in for. And what they're in for is to protect what they see as the core of America. So I'm still chewing a little bit on the thing you said about five minutes ago at this point, about would they choose to live in a homogeneous community ethnically that has politically diverse views, or would they choose to live in an ethnically diverse community that is politically homogeneous 
and shares their securitarian leanings, I find that quite convincing. I mean, I do think that one of the things that we miss out when we flatten Trump and his projects into white supremacy, I think it's absolutely true that Trump was shamefully complicit with certain white supremacists, but he was not willing to call them out as he was not willing to call anybody out who supported him, essentially. He did sort of in a mini mouth way every now and again, uh, but he, his instinct clearly was just that anybody who liked him, he would try to avoid criticizing them. So he wasn't very willing to draw those lines, which I think you have a moral responsibility to do as a leading politician. But it is true, for example, that often minority candidates have actually done very well in Republican primaries. And we're relatively close at two points. You had Black candidates leading in the Republican presidential primaries. Now, they were in turbulent primaries and they ended up not doing as well. But both Ben Carson and... Herman Cain, way back when. Yeah, Herman Cain, exactly. With the immortal line asked about the president of Uzbekistan, but nobody would care whether or not he knew the name of the president of Uzbekistan. And the point is that that spoke, that sort of dismissal of whether you need to know about the president of Uzbekistan and what people care about is whether I fight for you, that spoke to, I think, a lot of the same coalition that ended up electing Donald Trump. So there's something too simple about saying that is white supremacy, because I think if your model of white supremacy is that people are perfectly happy to vote for a black presidential candidate, as long as they share your beliefs, that's overly simplistic, right? Yeah. If I could cut in there for just a second, because one of the things I tried to figure out was why Trump supporters are absolutely convinced that they are not racist. And they do, they believe that. And I think you've hit on one of the elements of that. You know, for them, they're fine with African Americans if they adopt a securitarian point of view, as both Ben Carson and Herman Cain basically did. I mean, they were, for the most part, in it for the core of America. You know, there's nothing that says only white people can have these securitarian attitudes. And in fact, in my survey, I find that there really are quite a few, both blacks and Hispanics, that do have securitarian kinds of dispositions. I think what happens, though, of course, and the reason is fairly rare for blacks and well, especially Blacks, less so with Hispanics, to support people like Donald Trump is because as long as you're treated as an outsider, that's pretty hard for you to, to be enthusiastic about it. But just in terms of their ideological conviction, their, their desire for security and for kind of America first ideas, that's not something that's unique to whites. So I think that helps us understand a little bit why they're convinced they're not racist, even though they would certainly appear to be. And also, by the way, that helps to explain why it is that politics in Africa and Latin America is not exactly a left-wing dream and why it is so naive for left-wingers in America to believe that as soon as the country will be majority minority, it'll somehow turn into a left-wing nation. That's right. And it's why I think if way down the line, as Blacks and Latinos are made to feel more like insiders, then I think we're going to see a little bit of a can't win situation for the Democrats. I think you'll see increasing diversity within those ethnic and racial groups. They can kind of let their, what for some of them is a securitarian predisposition manifest itself. Yeah, that's very interesting. So I guess, you know, fast forwarding, why is it that you are so worried about the disengagement pathway, which is to say that if the Republican Party chose a less securitarian candidate in 2024, and the people with the most strongly securitarian personality would lack a political home, as arguably they had lacked a political home for much of the last decades. You know, of course, it is sad to think that there will be some American citizens who feel really disengaged and who feel really disrespected or who feel really unrepresented. But I struggle to see why that is such a worrying pathway, right? You always have a portion of a population that feels very disengaged from politics, that feels like most people up there don't really care for me and they don't really speak for my concerns. It's not a great thing. I'm not trying to trivialize that. But to me, that sounds, given the alternatives we've discussed, like one of the better things that might happen over the course of the next 10 years. So why should we be so worried if the next president, like kind of a Republican Party, might turn out to be Ben Sass, and a lot of these secretarians who voted for Trump don't come out to vote, and they feel a little resentful and they feel a little angry. Perhaps they post hateful things on you know, some social media platform. Why should that concern us as much as something like the presidency of, of Donald Trump? Yeah, no, that's interesting. I forced a graduate seminar of mine to read a draft of the book before it was published. This would have been a year ago. And one of the students I remember had a very similar reaction. He said, look, if our biggest concern is a bunch of these guys just going off into their little enclaves or forming militias, then, you know, he's okay with that, given the alternative. And, you know, I can see that. And I hope you're right. You know, obviously, there's a potential real advantage to the Democratic Party 
if indeed those individuals just, you know, having kind of tasted, having a moment in the sun, and now Trump goes away, obviously they're going to be more difficult to keep within the confines of the Republican Party going forward. And so that's, you know, perhaps we're looking at, you know, a period of time where the Democrats have a little bit of an advantage in that regard. So yeah, I'm willing to accept that, you know, the notion that one fifth of the population should be like this. And I'm just afraid that it's not like they just go away and don't pay attention to politics. I think they can still create quite a bit of mischief. And I am worried about you know, at the extremes, this kind of desire to form militia groups. And, you know, there's a lot of personal agency with these people. It's not just a desire to have a strong America, but they like to be part of it. This is where I think gun ownership, as opposed to just having a strong military, comes into play. In fact, I had a survey item in which I asked them, if you had a choice between having a really strong military or having the right to bear arms, which would you pick? And guess what? Right to bear arms won overwhelmingly among the people who really like Donald Trump. So to be involved in this, to think that they're contributing, and I think that's part of the reason that their active support for Donald Trump was so important to them. It gave them a sense that they had personal agency in bringing about these kinds of securitarian policies. So I guess I still worry that there's a potential for danger, and it probably is better than the alternative of a right-wing nativist takeover of American politics. But I still think it should probably not be taken too glibly. So we've talked a little bit about what the left might do to de-emphasize the kind of issues that trigger the securitarian impulse. I mean, what should the right do? I mean, is the right instinct for somebody who wants to win the Republican presidential nomination in 2024 and return the Republican Party to respect for our democratic institutions and norms, to go as far away as possible from that and try and build a coalition that doesn't require any of the 20% of Securitarian people or that perhaps doesn't trigger the distinctions that makes that salient? Or is it a matter of reassuring people that you are going to fight for some of those Securitarian interests without sort of aggravating it? I mean, is there a way of sort of reassuring people that have these Securitarian fears in a way that isn't damaging to our democratic institutions or that doesn't inflict significant injustices on whoever ends up being on the outsider part of this insider-outsider dynamic. One of the things I did in my survey was to give people a list of 20 issues and say, what's the most important issue for you? And what I found was that over 60% of Trump supporters, their most important issue was either immigration, national defense, law and order, or gun rights. But that means that 40% roughly picked a different issue. You know, maybe they were concerned about abortion. Maybe they were concerned about taxes and regulation. They're all across the board. So what I thought was interesting, though, was then I asked them to tell me their second most important issue. And almost everybody who listed a non-security issue as being most important to them listed a security issue as the second most important. So maybe you can see where I'm going here. I think in terms of issues, the Republican coalition is not in as much danger as we might think. I think a lot of the people who maybe are Christian evangelicals, you know, they're not going to say that I don't care about reducing immigration or, you know, having a strong defense. Most of them do. So I think in that sense, they're probably going to be okay. Where I think the real danger comes for the Republicans is Trump himself and this more personality-based thing. What's he going to do? And to the extent he feels left out or that he's not getting sufficient pats on his back or deference then I think he's capable of pulling a big chunk of his followers with him. So the danger, I'm not answering your question directly, saying whether they're in in good shape or bad shape, but I think it's a maybe this, maybe that, because if they decide on the basis of policy issues, they're going to be fine. If they really are so keyed up with Trump as a person and what he's done for them that they can't divorce themselves from that, then I think the Republican Party is in real trouble. So I think in the literature on authoritarianism, there is a sort of implied link that if you have a authoritarian personality, you're also very, very likely to favor a leader who stands for them. That part of your authoritarian personality is to look for a leader to identify with who can, in fact, command you and everybody else. It's less clear that that's exactly the case with a authoritarian personality, right? Because as you were pointing out, it is, for example, interesting that in your surveys, people prefer the right to bear arms to sort of the strong army with a general at the top of it in a very hierarchical kind of way. So what is the connection between the Securitarian personality and hierarchy? And what is the connection between Securitarian personality and the desire for a charismatic leader? Which is to say, can we draw on some of your research to make a prediction 
about whether at this point people in America with a Sakura Town personality have formed such a strong bond with Donald Trump that he's going to be able to retain a great majority of them? Or will they be just as happy to say, you know what, he fought for us, we still like him, but he lost. And, you know, now there's a bunch of other people running in 2024 who appeal to some of our secretarian instincts in different ways. And, you know, perhaps they can do a better job for us and we're just as happy to sort of transfer to them. See, I guess my reading of recent events is actually that they kind of support my position in the sense that you did see some people who had been very strong Trump supporters who started to turn against him as soon as he said, well, you know, I'm going to concede the election or, you know, some of the things that they didn't really want him to do. And so to me, that suggests that, no, it's not just he's an authority figure, therefore I'm going to follow him. I mean, these people aren't like goslings that just kind of bond with whatever powerful figure is around when they come out of the egg. You know, they want a certain set of policy positions. And if they don't think that leader is giving them those policy positions, they're going to turn on him in a minute. And I guess that's what I'm trying to point out, that I think what we look at as just some kind of I love Donald Trump thing is actually I love Donald Trump because to me, he just oozes these kinds of securitarian positions. I mean, from way back when, when he took on the Central Park Five, you know, he demonstrated that he was in it for this core group and anybody who didn't play by the rules and who might be minorities, they were suspect. So I'm reacting a little bit to the view that's out there that says Donald Trump was just a great actor and he didn't really believe this, but he realized that he could get a lot of political headway by adopting these positions. To me, the securitarians have a very good instinct for who's really with them at the core and who isn't. And they didn't think that people like John McCain or Mitt Romney were actually securitarians at the core. So what actually drives the nature of the in-group, out-group distinction, right? I mean, if a securitarian is somebody who really cares about protecting the group of insiders against outsiders and who's primed to perceive threats from outsiders in a stronger way than other people, whose attention is going to be more grabbed by a member of the outsider group somehow harming an insider or potentially posing a threat to insiders. What is it that determines whether you're an insider or an outsider? Because I think different strands of this conversation have pointed in such different directions. On the one side, you describe it as often an ideological preference that perhaps Trump supporters or securitarians in any case would be happier with an ethnically diverse society that's ideologically homogeneous, where everybody wants extreme law and order policies and an extremely strong border and all of those other kinds of things. On the other hand, when you invoke things like the Central Park Five, uh, that does just seem as though the insider-outsider distinction falls quite neatly along racial lines, that a lot of the threat in the case of the Central Park Five is they were black and the victim of a crime was white. And if it turns out that the insider-outsider distinction just always so happens to be drawn along racial lines, then I'm not sure how much a theory gives us beyond a sort of straightforward account of, no, actually, this is racist, right? Like, actually, what this is, is you're serving the interests of whites over those who are not white. So to what extent is the line drawn along racial lines, and what sort of determines how the line is drawn? Well, obviously, the our conception of who's an insider and who's an outsider has changed a lot over the decades and centuries. Um, Catholics, Irish, Italians, you know, they were outsiders for a long time, and they're not anymore. So that changes. You know, I think right now we're seeing changes with regard to GLBTQ community. I think securitarians are going to be much more welcoming to females and to GLBTQ individuals. I think as we go along, gradually there won't be that vision that they're automatically outsiders. I think immigrants and racial minorities, I think those groups are going to take longer, but it's certainly possible. So I guess my larger point was that I think way down the line, eventually, it seems to me we're building toward a situation in which those ideological differences are probably at the core. That's that's not to minimize the great distance we have to travel with regard to race, of course. But yeah, I I don't think you can sit back and say, well, we've forever defined who's an insider and an outsider. That's going to change. It's just it's going to change a lot more slowly for people who are securitarians and those who aren't. I guess this is a larger question that I'm grappling with, which is that, you know, humans clearly have a very deep tendency to divide the world into in-groups and out-groups. And they seem very ready to favor the in-group over the out-group, even when the nature of a group is quite frivolous. So I've been thinking a lot about the experiments of somebody called Henry Teifel, who created all of these very arbitrary groups 
just by asking people to estimate the number of dots on a sheet of paper. And then, you know, if you're a group of the underestimators who thought that there were fewer dots than there really were, you're willing to discriminate immediately against the group of overestimators. I mean, really a frivolous kind of thing. So that seems to show that humans are incredibly varied in how they draw these in-group, out-group boundaries, and that anything can really become that in-group, out-group boundary. Sorry to cut in for just a second, but, you know, I think those social psychological experiments, whether Teufels on weak groups or Milgram's on obedience, you know, I think the thing I wish they would have done a little better at is to look at how people are different. You know, in, in Milgram's experiment, for example, not everybody went all the way and administered 430 volts or thought they were doing that. A lot of them just said, forget it. I don't want your money. I'm not going to... We need to focus more on that variation. And to me, mm-hmm. it's the same thing with the weak groups. You know, not everybody just automatically said, oh, you're in a different group. I don't care how frivolous that distinction was. So I'm into individual variation across humans. And I think one of the most important variations is the extent to which they base their worldview on insider outsider terms. Interesting. Yeah. So that makes sense that you have some people who immediately very strongly punish the out group. Some people do it a little bit. And I was just saying, hang on a second. No, actually, I won't. But I was driving at a slightly different question, which is that, look, like you can produce groups and in-group discrimination in these very frivolous ways. But when you look around the world, most of the salient political distinctions still are across a set of pretty basic lines. They tend to be around some form of ethnicity, around some form of religion, perhaps to some extent, some form of cultural nation, right? And so I guess to what extent is ethnicity always going to be the main driver of in-group, out-group distinctions? And perhaps the exact nature of which group is in and which group is out might change. You know, I think there's a strong argument from Michael Lind, for example, that actually America has always been black and non-black rather than white and non-white. And perhaps eventually, as some people like Richard Alba argue, Latinos and Asian Americans are going to be part of the in-group, but African Americans might remain part of the out-group. But you can certainly have a lot of change over time But do you think that ethnicity will always be the primary driver of the in-group, out-group distinction and therefore the primary locus of energy for secretarians in the United States? Or is that not something that your study of psychology and history and so on suggests to you is likely or inevitable? No, I think race is such a clear marker of status as an insider or outsider, along with national orientation. So as I said before, I do think race and whether you're an immigrant or not, those to me are going to be the last things to fall if indeed we're moving in that direction. And I guess I do think we are. I, I think ideological perception and the, these attitudes toward outgroups, however they're defined, that to me is still a key distinction. And I think it's going to become ever more important. Yeah. So it's going to take a while, but that's the direction I think we're moving in. Ideological distinctions becoming more important than racial ones. Tell us something to end this conversation about what we can do with these insights. Whether you're a political activist, whether you're a private citizen, what takeaway should we draw from this for our own lives in terms of how to hopefully attenuate this in-group, out-group distinction, or at least the secretarian impulse in our society in such a way that the last 10 years end up being a little bit closer to your optimistic when you're pessimistic scenario? Well, I would say maybe I can help people's psychologies just a little bit by saying don't beat yourself up for not being able to talk your racist Trump-supporting Uncle Louie out of his positions. I just think these are deeper issues than can be dealt with by facts and figures. We could show Trump supporters all day long that there are more deaths caused by gun accidents than criminals using guns, and that wouldn't mean a thing to them because their orientation is that that's what concerns me, that's what threatens me. So I guess I'm just a little bit hopeful that if we can take that on board, that it's not like we'll give them a free pass and just say, well, they can't help themselves. But I do think to a certain extent, you have to recognize these are deep predispositions. This kind of goes back to some of my earlier work and and that I think we have some biological characteristics, whether they're genetic or whether they've been coming from the environment and then have become kind of physiologically instantiated. These are in us really deep. And it's not just because they listen to the wrong talk radio station. They listen to the wrong station because of those predispositions. So don't be so upset that you can't change them. And you recognize that, you know, it amazes me if you look around the world, that that 20% figure seems to pop up in a lot of countries. That's kind of the baseline core support for a lot of these nativist anti-immigrant parties. So I don't know if that's a coincidence or not, but it just seems like those people are there. They're going to be there. There might be certain periods of time when they are more ascendant than others, 
but let's not try to get rid of them as much as we might be tempted to do that, but let's instead learn how to talk to them and try to craft a political system in which both of them can exist, if not prosper. I think this is a really interesting takeaway from this. You know, I have two things that are going on in my mind sort of through this conversation. One is that I've been thinking a little bit about that guy from January 6th, from that horrible assault on the Capitol, who is sort of, you know, uh, half naked with a sort of Viking horns or whatever. And then it was found out a few days later that his mom was very upset because he's now in prison and he's refusing to eat because he's not getting organic food. And I do think that if you think of him as an authoritarian personality, that doesn't make much sense. That seems very inchoate. But if you think of it as a securitarian personality that's threatened by any form of kind of outside pollution, you suddenly see how there might actually be a link from his fear of non-organic food to his fear of something like, you know, dark forces stealing the election or something like that. It seems a little less in Kuwait than it might have done previously. That's great because, yeah, I think bluster is kind of a big part of this. You know, it helps them think that they're going to deter these threats if they can talk tough and have a gun in their closet. And yeah, the same for that guy dressing up. If you look beneath the surface, there's not much behind the bluster. Yeah, that's interesting. And the other thing that I'm thinking through is that the reason why things have gone crazy is that suddenly people with conspiracy theories and so on have a bigger voice in social media. And if only we block them from social media, if only we shut down Fox News, as some people have, I think, crazily been suggesting on Twitter and the Washington Post, then suddenly people won't have these beliefs and these instincts. And probably people watch Fox News and people listen to talk radio and people are attracted to conspiracy theories for much deeper reasons. And just restricting the access to them is not going to make as much of a difference as people hope. I think that's quite convincing. I think this conversation also leaves a question in my mind, which is, all right, so if we have 20% of people with a potentially securitarian personality, or for that matter, if you still believe in the authoritarian framework and say you have 25% of people with a potentially authoritarian framework, how do you manage them? And I guess the answer has to be something like, on the whole, you try to ignore them, and on the whole, you try to ensure that they're not driving your public policies, but you just have to throw them enough of a bone, and you just have to keep them in the tent enough that you don't wind up with a problem of either, you know, an endemic rebellion or violence, or them banding together to actually make somebody win the Republican primary, so make somebody win the presidential election. So it's a question, um, and there's a securitarian plane flying past here as I'm trying to say this. I think it must be an F-16 or something, actually. The securitarians would be pleased. But it's a matter of how do you manage them in your politics without letting them take over? Yeah, you made a really good point there that we should maybe underscore. I think this shift from viewing them as authoritarians to securitarians or whatever does suggest exactly what you're saying. They're not very good at coordinating their efforts. I think by instinct, they're kind of lone wolf type individuals. And obviously, don't take that too far because they've coordinated, you know, attacks on the Capitol and things like that. So it's there. But I still think their instinct is kind of to go off on their own and they don't pull together very well. Uh, They're not led very well, which to me is another reason we need to emphasize that they're not really authoritarian. So that may give some hope to those who are in the other camp that it kind of has to be all the forces coming together just right for them to really coordinate their efforts and the case of Donald Trump win office. John Hibbing, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. I really enjoyed your questions, Yasha. Thank you so much for listening to The Good Fight. Lots of listeners have been spreading the word about the show. If you too have been enjoying the podcast, please be like, rate the show on iTunes, tell your friends all about it, share it on Facebook or Twitter. And finally, please make suggestions for great guests or comments about the show to goodfightpod at gmail.com. That's goodfightpod at gmail.com. This recording carries a Creative Commons 4.0 international license. Thanks to Silent Partner for their song, Chess Pieces. Thank you.